So five. Okay, very good. Um, and uh, others will be joining us, I'm sure, as they um, get into the early evening here. Welcome, everybody. I'm Howard Glazer, the president of Tom Bethel's Brotherhood. Um, I want to welcome all of you and thank you all for joining us on, during this earliest star time. Uh, this event uh, originally was going to be a Sunday morning brunch. Uh, we have pivoted uh, with uh, COVID and some of the temple COVID policies. Uh, so thank you very much for spending the early part of um, this evening with us. I look forward to a very interesting, and you already can tell some discussion going on before the program even begins, uh, and a very lively presentation uh, along with that. And uh, now I want to introduce Matt Sadinsky, uh, uh, our co-chairman of our Brotherhood Program Committee and moderator for this evening, who will introduce the speakers and the program topic. Thank you, Matt, for planning this. Oh, you're very welcome, um, How Howard, and I thank you all for coming. Yes. So living in Charlotte by choice, we're one of the fastest growing cities in the country. So when I saw what was coming through the city council and through count, through county about development, we started talking about how we would do a program like this. And I reached out to Lay, who said, you got to talk to uh, Dimple. And Dimple said, you know, we have a great planning team. And in fact, outreach is part of our goal. So we'll do this. Um, I, I'm not going to take a long time here, but what our structure will be 45 minutes of presentation. And then we have a chat room. If you would send your questions to Howard Glazer, we will, in the chat box, after about 45 minutes, we'll take some questions and I'll kind of moderate that part of the discussion. Uh, but before we get started, Lay, if you wanted to say a few words and then Dimple, I'll turn it to you and then I'll turn it to Allison and Alicia um, to, to talk. Oh, thanks so much, everybody. My name is Lee Altman. I'm a Mecklenburg County Commissioner serving at large, so I represent all 1.1 million residents of the county. Um, I am a, a member of Temple Israel, and I'm up at Shalom Park a lot. Um, and, you know, just I'm, most of the conversation tonight, I think, will center more around city issues, which is why I brought in my good friend Dimple Ajmera, um, because I think she'll be able to answer all your questions. But, um, you know, just to remind you, you know, county is public health, mental health. We give three quarters of a billion dollars to CMS, welfare, DSS, our park uh, recreation programs, just to name some of the high points of the um, programs um, and services we're responsible for. So uh, I'm going to drop my cell phone in the chat so that if you do have any questions um, in the future, you know, it's, you know, feel free to reach out to me. I'd always love to talk to you. I'm here to serve you and thanks. And Dimple is on the uh, <clears throat> chair of the environmental committee. And Dimple, why don't you introduce yourself? Yes, Matt, thank you so much for planning this. I appreciate it. And Commissioner Altman, it's always an honor to work alongside with you and I appreciate the connection. And uh, to all the members, thank you so much for having us tonight. Well, 2040 plan, it's certainly a dry topic but we'll try to make it interesting as much as we can. Well, I'm Dimple Ajmer. I have an honor to represent you all on Charlotte City Council as your at-large member, which means all 900,000 residents in the city of Charlotte. And um, currently our focus is on Charlotte 2040 plan. As you know, there is development happening all over the city. I mean, Matt said it in his introduction, it's one of the fastest growing cities that we live in. And how do we grow as a city that is sustainable for next generations to come? We don't want to be another Atlanta or Los Angeles where they are trying to now figure out and address the traffic and congestion issues that have gotten so bad. And so a 2040 plan, actually it's the community's vision for future growth and development for generations to come. And this is a first comprehensive plan that we adopted last year in 40 years. Uh, Charlotte didn't have a plan, comprehensive plan all these years. So this is very important. Uh, tonight you'll hear about two key initiatives that will begin to put the vision that we adopted into an action. First, it's called the Charlotte future 2040 policy map. So the policy map processing, it's a mapping process 
that is meant to translate the place-based policies from the comprehensive plan to specific location. So it's all it's doing is translating our vision into a place-based mapping. And it will serve as a guidance for creating great places where we don't get stuck in traffic for so long. And you'll hear, on, you'll hear about that in depth from our uh, very capable staff. We have interim planning director, Allison Craig, and we also have Alicia Osborne with us today. And they'll take, they'll actually give you a deeper dive into our 2040 policy mapping exercise and what does it mean for you? And second, we have what it's called UDO, Unified Development Ordinance. It's a new set of development regulations that's going to help implement our vision and provide a more predictable and transparent process for our community. Um, so at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Alicia and Allison. And if you have any questions, I'm here. The most important part of this process is an engagement. I can tell you, when you look at our UDO, it's a 600 plus page document. Our, and it's very complex. Most of the council, including uh, neighborhood leaders, I mean, we had to do a lot of hand holding. So you're, you, there will be a lot of information being thrown at you. You may not get everything in one go and that is okay. That's why we are here to answer any questions, concerns. I will, uh, I will include my email address in the chat box. So feel free to email me. If there are other engagement sessions that you'd like us to have, we are here for it. So Allison and Alicia, do you wanna take it from here? Well, thank you. Let me introduce Allison first. She's okay. been the deputy planning director for the city of Charlotte for four years. And effective February 1, she'll become the interim planning director when Taiwo Jaioba departs the city of Charlotte and joins the city of Greensboro. Allison previously worked for UNC Charlotte as the co-director of the Childress Klein Center for Real Estate and the director of master science in their in a real estate program. Allison has a bachelor's of science in biology from UNC Chapel Hill and a master of science in sustainable development and a master of science in real estate. And Allison, why don't you uh, take it from here? And then when you're ready, I, I have a little bio on Alicia as well. Well, I'm going to mostly turn this off to uh, turn this over to Alicia. So I'll just say really quick that um, we really appreciate being here today, and thank you for taking time out of your evening to learn a little bit more about the planning department and some of the things that we're doing to really try and shape the city and to be um, a world class city. Um, as Councilmember Ajmira uh, mentioned, we're going to talk about two initiatives. Um, that are really key parts of implementing the city's vision for growth and the comprehensive plan, first being the policy map and then the UDO. Um, so Alicia is the project manager for the comprehensive plan as well as for the policy map. Um, and Laura Harmon is the project manager for the UDO. And on her behalf tonight, I'll go over a, a, a little bit on the UDO after Alicia talks you through the policy map and just what we're doing since the uh, comprehensive plan was adopted in June. So I'll let you, I'll pass it off back then to you, to, to you, Matt, and you can introduce okay, Alicia because she's up Thank next. Alicia, <laughs> Alicia Davis Osborne has over 20 years of public private sector experience. She's the manager and assistant director for the city of Charlotte's planning, design, and development department. She's project manager for this Charlotte Future 2040 comprehensive plan. And that's our first comprehensive plan in almost 50 years. And prior to returning to the public sector in December two. 2019, Alicia was the Vice President of Planning and Development for Charlotte's Downtown Business Improvement District, where she managed a $1.5 million grant from the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation to strategically guide equitable growth and development in the historic West End, Charlotte's oldest Black neighborhoods. Alicia began her career as a transportation planner with the Charlotte Transportation and with Parsons Brinkerhoff, now WSP, and a zoning specialist with the city of Jackson, Mississippi. Alicia, a Mississippi native, has a Bachelor of Arts degree in Political Science Pre-Law from Tougaloo College and a Master of Arts degree in Urban and Regional Planning 
with an emphasis in environment land use law from Jackson State University. She also has professional certifications in nonprofit management from Duke and commercial real estate from Cornell University, my alma mater. Now, Alicia is a certified planner in the American Institute of Certified Planners and a member of the American Planning Association, North Carolina. And um, with that, let me turn it over to you, Alicia. Thank you all for the opportunity to share. And I'll kick our conversation off with a short video um, to Dimple's point. Um, our goal tonight is not to put you to sleep. So we figure a short kind of animated video of, of really um, describe in kind of very short and simple way of what we're uh, working on over the next couple of years. All right. And go. Bottom left hand corner. City Council Thank you. adopted the Charlotte Future Can you hear it? Comprehensive plan. It could be so, a little louder. Now that the plan has been adopted, how will it affect you? For neighborhoods and residents, the plan outlines what you can expect to see in the future. It includes updated programs, policies, and projects to address the needs of residents throughout Charlotte. Are you a business owner? Great! The plan defines Charlotte's priorities for future investment. It offers flexibility on how properties may be used throughout the city. This will allow you more opportunities to enhance and open your business in a desired neighborhood. If you are a developer, the plan offers updated and clear land use goals through place types, providing better and more transparent guidance for future development. It provides a clear definition of where land uses are envisioned to occur. If you are an appointed official or work for a public agency, the plan reflects the community's values and priorities. This offers you, as a decision maker, a clear understanding of what is important to the people of Charlotte. You now have a guide that will provide direction for future growth. So, what's next? The creation of the visual companion into the 2040 plan called the 2040 Policy Map. This process will translate the policies of the 2040 plan into an easy to follow map of the types of places across the city. Next up is the release of the first Charlotte Unified Development Ordinance, or UDO. This process will simplify, consolidate, and update the standards that guide development into a single document. And lastly, working on transportation initiatives including the Charlotte Strategic Mobility Plan which will help make the Charlotte Future 2040 Comprehensive Plan's vision for providing safe and equitable ways for people to get around as the city grows a reality. So, how can you stay engaged? You can participate in the 2040 policy mapping process beginning in July and concluding in December 2021, the Unified Development Ordinance process beginning late summer or early fall, and by staying updated on the Charlotte Strategic Mobility Plan. And of course, be sure to follow Charlotte Planning on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram to learn more about how this plan will affect you, what the next steps are, and how to stay engaged, please visit our website. We hope that you will do your part and stay involved in guiding the growth and implementation of our shared vision for Charlotte's growth over the next 20 years. It's always a fun little video. Let me see if I can stop it. Next slide. All right, so um, the video mentioned three major initiatives and they are the key kind of implementation steps for the comprehensive plan. I'm sure you guys uh, read something in the paper or some blog or heard something in your neighborhood conversations about the comp plan. And again, as um, council member, as Mira mentioned, this is a really transformative piece of work that the community has led to um, set a vision for growth and development over the next 20 years. So tonight I'll focus on the 2040 policy map, which is um, takes the policies within the plan and places on the map to make land use decisions. And then Allison will talk about the regulatory tool to uh, implement that, that land use vision. So what is the 2040 policy map? Again, it takes those policies within the comp plan that talks about creating great places, places where we live, work and play, and place them on the map and actually provide locations for where they should go. 
It also will provide um, updated guidance for land use policies within the city. Um, only 25% of our, our neighborhoods or our city has current um, land, land use guidance. So there's a large part of our community that um, refer to 20 year old plans and plans that don't quite reflect our current vision for growth and development. So this map will all at one time update that um, land use guidance, no matter where you are in the community and start afresh and making sure that we achieve the overall vision for the city. So here's an example of what is meant by place-based policy. I know a lot of times we use these very technical words, but for example, um, within the comp plan, we talk a lot about neighborhood diversity and inclusion. How do we make our neighborhoods more diverse and provide more housing options and be more inclusive in the styles and, and range of development we might see within our neighborhoods and in our community? So the, the comp plan, I mean, the policy map would take those and actually uh, assign locations to where those types of policies will go. And a, a, another example would be a goal that talks about diverse and re resilient economic opportunity. Um, that speaks to where do we want to create jobs in our community? How do we make um, those jobs accessible to the people who need it the most? How do we make sure that those locations are in places that shorten transportation trips or provide options for people to walk, bike, or take transit to get to those jobs. So those are the types of policies that this um, policy map will actually assign to geographies. Another uh, goal of the map is to make sure that we're balancing how we plan to grow with areas or um, opportunities um, and actually address those areas of needs. I mentioned um, the jobs need. Um, there are a lot of our parts of our community that um, people are traveling for great distances and transferring two and three buses just to get to work. So how are we more intentional about placing those jobs and the types of jobs and the locations to shorten those trips and to make it more accessible for our residents and uh, for people who decide to move here in the future? And then also thinking um, more about as we intensify where we um, place this growth, that we are placing it where the infrastructure is planned to go or where it can already accommodate it. Um, before the call tonight, we talked about traffic and, and how do we uh, make sure that we're being more mindful and intentional about placing that growth in, in locations that make sense. This map helps us to do that in a more intentional and thoughtful way. So um, we talked about the policy map and the new tool called place types. What place types are is just a new way of thinking about land use. The way we talk about land use now is kind of one dimensional. This place or this parcel is used for residential or this place parcel is used for commercial. The way place type works, it thinks about how those uses um, um, relate to each other or how do they create place? How do I think about places where I can live, work, and play in close proximity to each other? And then thinking about um, if we're going to have these uses in these locations, what do they look like? What does that character look like, that building form? And how do we move about within those places? Um, that's what place types does for us. That's a tool that's used um, pretty commonly across the country. But it was introduced to North Carolina um, back in around 2010. And so uh, we've had some, um, some time to really think about how does this um, align with where we want to grow as a community and start thinking more comprehensively about how we grow, how we move about in these places and connect to the things in a more thoughtful way, and then providing open space and green spaces uh, where um, they should go also in these places. So here's the place type palette that was adopted within the comprehensive plan. This set the foundation for the work that we're doing now with the policy map. Essentially, we work with the community to say, um, are these the types of places that we want to see in the future? And are the characteristics within these uh, groupings, do they fit the needs of where of, of the type of growth and development we want to see in the community? So it talks about parks. Um, how do we preserve those green spaces? 
Um, how do they fit in our neighborhoods? Um, how do we transition to um, more dense development from our single family neighborhoods by providing more intense residential development in appropriate locations? Um, as we're creating more jobs, how do we complement those jobs with places for people to eat? Um, maybe to drop the kids off at daycare as they're on their way to um, jobs or um, dropping the kids off at school. How do we be more thoughtful about creating those places in the future? And this place type palette um, helps us to get to that, um, that vision for growth and development. So the place type palette, um, as I mentioned, was a new um, land use classification that took us from thinking about land use in one dimension and looking at it multidimensional. And this is an example of how, um, an illustration of how those uses work together. And this is really just a picture of our everyday lives. When we wake up in the morning, we th um, if we're still working, how do we be mindful about our trips to work? Can we stop and get groceries on our way back from home? Or when we're picking up the kids, maybe on our lunch break, how do we go to the library? Or maybe um, to the doctor or get a, um, do a doctor's visit? How do we make sure we're mindful about the things we need in our community and the placement of those? Let me and then provide, Let me and, uh -oh. and providing the infrastructure um, to, to accommodate that growth in the future. Um, I talked a little bit about this slide. Um, maybe I'm going backwards. I am. All right. So the place, the policy map process is in three steps and our engagement process uh, moves along these three steps. So the first step was mapping existing development. That was just to simply show people how the place type pattern would work. And so we kicked off the process last summer, immediately after the comp plan adoption in June, we started in July, just talking with people about what this um, palette will do and how it works and what it means and just showing people examples and getting people comfortable with the new tool. And then the next step was to map the current policies that we have in terms of guidance for land use. I think um, people forget that our council uses policy every day to make decisions about growth and development and how we spend our tax dollars. And so in terms of land development, how might those, um, how, what would those um, policies look like on a map using that place type palette. And then the final step is showing what will our vision look like in the future. And so that's the map that's um, out on the streets today. We released it on Tuesday and we welcome you all and I'll share a little bit later how to get involved and how to view that map and provide comments. So here's the engagement process. Again, I mentioned phase one kicked off in July with a survey. Um, we did mailers, um, sent a postcard to every parcel or resident within our community to engage them on the process to make sure they knew that this was happening. Um, and with that, we received almost 5,000 responses to the survey and have had continued engagement from those who started from phase one. The next phase, we were able to go out and do some pop-up meetings and do some virtual meetings and have some online conversations with different people about the map, and then um, having some drop-in hours for people to just come to us and talk to us about their concerns about the map. Um, I will say that this level of engagement around this map is very different than the comp plan. Um, the comp plan process was about three years, so when you see the numbers of engagement, it says 500,000 people. Um, that was over a course of three years. We've been doing this for a nine to nine, eight to nine months. And so the numbers look a little bit different, but what I will say, although we might not have the quantity, the quality of the conversations that we're having with residents who are telling us um, how they feel about the recommendations and how they envision this impacting their future for growth and developing their neighborhoods has been really, really um, helpful in this process. And we want to continue to have that partnership and with developing these types of initiatives in the future. So we're really excited about that. We kicked off phase three on Tuesday with the release of the second draft of the map. And then I'll go over the schedule moving forward. But again, we're continuing to engage and, and receive feedback in the process. So if you go to our website, cltfuture2040.com, you will see this page that takes you 
um, to the map. You click on the button to see the new map that's revised. And then right below that is a button that takes you to all the different ways to be engaged. Um, again, COVID has been very restricting in how we can engage, but what we've been really intentional about doing is making sure that we meet people where they are, provide alternative languages to um, our materials. Um, for those who don't have access to the internet, we have this map at the um, library so people can go to the library and leave their comments, um, hard copies of the comments. If you want to call us, you can dial 311 and leave a message for our department and we'll get those comments that way. And then people can email us directly to um, share their comments um, and, and provide their feedback on the map. So this is what that second map looks like. Yes, it does look very intimidating, but um, it's very user-friendly in that you can zoom in, zoom out, in that upper left-hand corner, you can put your address, your address where you work, your address where you worship, any address you would like to put in to see what the recommendations are. Um, what we were intentional about doing with this map is the second draft. So we wanted to make sure that people understood the differences between the first draft and the second draft. So those large circles are where there were significant changes from the first draft to the second draft. If you click on the circle, a pop-up box will show the evolution of the change. So it will show the various versions of the map and how it changed to this current draft. And then in the left upper right-hand corner, there's a button um, and you can click on that and there are additional layers of information. We had a lot of folks asking about well, how did this map interact with the historic districts? You can click on the layer and then that information will appear, the boundaries for the historic district. Then folks wanted to know where, how does the proposed silver line light rail look on this map? There's an, uh, a, a layer that you can click on and that information will pop up. We wanted to be make sure that the map wasn't too busy, but also provide that feed those feature features to show for people to see the different additional information if they want to. So here's the engagement um, that we're planning to do from now until adoption with council. So again, the map was released on Tuesday. Um, next week, we, sign, we have 30 minute listening sessions that will be available for people to sign up. You can sign up as an individual or your neighborhood group or groups of people can sign up to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with staff about your concerns or feedback on the map. Then we will also have um, two community conversations um, at 12 o'clock and at six, at six o'clock on February 1st. Um, that's a townhouse style of meeting. We found those to be very helpful for people who like to see or like to hear what others are thinking. And sometimes that helps to trigger a thought or maybe um, have a trigger an idea as to uh, what they should be thinking about in their own neighborhoods or work or place of um, uh, play. So that opportunity is there. And then there's an opportunity to sign up and uh, have a hearing before council. And that date, I think that date um, may be different, but I'll make sure you guys receive the most recent um, version of the schedule. But there will be a public comment session before council. That's where you sign up and talk directly to council about your feedback on the policy map. That's an opportunity that we always have with these types of initi initiatives and we wanted to make sure we honor that process with this map as well. So here's the adoption schedule. That's the very technical side where our elected and appointed officials have time to deliberate, discuss, and provide feedback and back, uh, to staff. And then there are several iterations and back and forth about revisions. So this is that process. And then what we're ultimately asking our elected officials to do on February 28th is to adopt this map. Um, um, and then that puts us in a place to move forward with our unified development ordinance on work. So with that, I will entertain any questions if you guys wanna do that or wait to the end. Well, let's put it in Allison. the... Uh... Let's put it into the chat <clears throat> and then okay. we'll turn it over to Allison to talk about the UDO and to help you a little bit. <clears throat> our uh, brotherhood is about 200 members and we have about 800 families in our temple and we're part of a campus here. And as members of the Jewish community, we have a long history of planning 
before Moses, there was a guy named Joseph who interpreted dreams. And he interpreted the dreams of the seven fat cows and the seven skinny cows. And that led to strategic planning mm -hmm. for um, skinny times. And then a guy named um, Moses, a different Moses in the 1940s here was head of the Federal Highway Administration. And with states were getting federal highway funds to complete building the highways. Robert mm -hmm. Moses and the Federal Robert Highway Moses. Administration put in the Comprehensive Planning Act that said yep. states had to get um, comprehensive plans if they mm -hmm. were going to get federal highway funds. And um, how cities and states then interpret this require rules about how they build. And I think, Allison, that takes you to the UDO. Matt, you're speaking to my heart. That was just, <laughs> that was a crash course in planning. And you just stole my heart. Thank you so much. Well, you know, Alicia, and if you go back further, you know, we're such rugged individuals in America, you know, back in the 1700s, private property was everything. So finally, about 1800s, people said, you know what, we better start taking care of how we handle our waste and how we handle. So there was actually, you know, the sanitary reform movement in the 1840s. And then it took until the 1960s when we had the EPA saying, yeah. you know, it's not a good idea for Duke to put their coal ash here and so mm -hmm. forth. So it's a whole evolution of balancing private property, private enterprise with regulation. And um, it's really a very interesting le lesson in civics and then how cities will engage with populations because every city today is dealing with vigilance, how to you know, be safer, avoid you know, gun violence, how to be agile, how to move change and how to be resilient because no matter how vigilant and agile you are, things are gonna happen. And planning is part of the way cities get, you know, focus uh, the attention to make that happen. Matt, then we have a question. Uh, Mike Firestone, if you will unmute, you can ask your question, Mike. Thank you. Mike, do, do you hear me? I'll, I'll, I'll ask Mike. I'll ask Mike's question. Uh, he wants to know what is the plan for our future water supply, capacity for future growth and safety of the supply? Thank you. I think I'm unmuted now. Okay, there you are. <laughs> Good question. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. So, so, Michael, what I will say about that, and Allison may be able to help as well, a part of this plan um, was working really closely with our, um, our team at uh, Charlotte Water. Um, they are currently working on the water master plan. And what we were intentional about doing as we talk about growth and have these growth projections and all these tables and, and um, projections about where we should grow, they're using the same data to develop their master plan. And so they're being intentional about um, planning their future infrastructure investments to accommodate that growth. A large part of this work as well is um, a fiscal impact analysis where um, it takes our growth projections, it puts it in this, this fancy model that tells us um, how the city needs to prepare financially to accommodate or provide services for that growth. And so that's a separate but parallel process and um, pro two processes that will, will help us to figure out how to make sure we are um, addressing our water needs and to accommodate the future growth. Um, I'm not sure where they are with that plan. I know they are working on it, but um, I can share your question and then provide information to Matt um, to find out the status and who to contact to make sure we get more detail, if that's all right. Thank you. You're welcome. Matt, there are no other questions to me in the chat if you um, want to move on. Yeah, great. Allison, what does UTO stand for? All right, Unified Development Ordinance. Now it gets really exciting. Um, <laughs> next slide, Alicia, please. Is this um, one it? Yes, thank you. So um, the first draft of the Unified Development Ordinance um, was released on October the 7th. This is something that staff has been working on for quite a long time. Um, um, even before Ty and myself came to the city, we were starting to work towards creating this ordinance that um, had all the relative pieces in one place so it was easier to use because right now we've got a series of ordinances that were developed over the course of 30 years and there's conflicts and some of them are dated. And so 
working on this and then um, really started to think, particularly when Ty, who's the current planning director, came on board, well, we don't really have a comprehensive vision for growth. We really need to understand what we want to be and what, where, you know, where, how we see growth occurring and where before we start to, to put together the set of rules that really implements that. So we hit pause on developing this and um, worked on the comprehensive plan, which of course was adopted, and then have the first draft of the UDO um, out right now. Next slide, Alicia. Allison, before we go on, I have a question for you. Could you, when you use the term growth, are you, are you talking about population growth? Or what, I just wanna make sure I understand the concept because it, it seems to be a very important part of the whole principle of the 240 plan. Sure, I think it's everything really. I mean, growth means you have people coming to Charlotte and they have places where they need to live, places where they need to work, where they want to play. Um, so it's really, it's, it's encompassing everything that's, that relates to having um, just a, a vibrant and successful and um, city for people to live in. So it's, it's, it's really everything. Thank you. That makes sense. So Alicia talked, I think she came to the group a while back talking about, of course, the comprehensive plan being our overall uh, overarching vision. And one of the key ways in which this is implemented is through the set of regulations and ordinances that when people go to develop, um, whether it's homes or apartment buildings or um, malls or whatever it is, that's the set of regulations that they use to understand what sort of parameters that they have to construct their buildings under. Uh, next slide. So the outline of the UDO, um, as Council Member Ajmira said, it is a very technical document. It is 608 pages. And I'll tell you that that's a major haircut than all the other ordinances that came before it, which probably were in maybe 1,500 pages. So um, with a lot more text, this is um, more concise, even though it is um, a large document with a lot of tables um, and uh, figures to really try and help um, the, the user uh, understand the document. So it set up the outline, um, just introductory provisions. There's a large section on zo um, zoning. So what the different zoning districts are, what you can do within those, and then just things like setbacks and height and different development standards that relate to the particular zoning district that you're under. There's a whole section on subdivision streets and infrastructure. So um, when streets are required, what those streets need to look like. There's a section on stormwater and natural resources where um, we have um, our tree ordinance uh, is in this particular section and some increased uh, regulations for stormwater to really just protect our homeowners from flooding. And then finally, just how the actual document works. So who administers it and how you go through different approval processes like rezonings and, uh, and similar. You know, the next one. So because it is so technical, um, soon after it was released, um, we developed a reference guide. And so this is a, a much smaller, easier way to digest what the development ordinance is. And so it, it's kind of a hybrid of walking you through the ordinance as well as starting to hit on some of the key items that are new to the UDO um, that we haven't had in Charlotte before. And so um, you can use that if you go to our website, go to charlotteudo.org. At the very top is a little button for helpful resources. Oh, thank you very much for putting that in there. Um, and you can go and review that document just to get um, an understanding of, of what's in there. And so some of the new concepts, as I mentioned, um, are, are in there. And so you can walk through that in that way. Um, next slide. So we are starting to receive feedback on the document um, from a variety of individuals, from community members, as well as the development community that you know, will be using this to develop properties in the future. We've got an online portal. Um, we've had, I think it's just right there, 100 plus comments, but I think we're probably about up to 500 at this point. Um, and what we're starting to do is put uh, those comments on the web so you can see what people are saying. And starting next week, we'll begin answering some of the, the comments that we've received in that portal. And sometimes it'll be a, an actual response, like this is what um, 
it, maybe it's a question and so we answer it. Sometimes it's a, I think you should do, I think you should change it to say this and it might be that we agree. And in, in some cases we are still having conversations around topics that um, you know, we are hearing from the community that warrant further discussion. So we've had some open house meetings. The virtual conversations that we've begun having have been um, pretty well attended. And you can go back on our YouTube page and view them. We've probably had about half, about same number of people attending in uh, virtually uh, live to the event as we've had go back and review the meeting um, through YouTube later, which is great. We've been meeting with different um, different communities and different industries, talking about areas that are of interest to them. And then we've certainly got, gotten letters and emails um, from directly from individuals and certainly a good way to correspond with us. And then also 311 is a way to give us feedback as well. Next slide. So the virtues, I mentioned the virtual conversations. I think these have been um, more successful than some of the open houses that we've um, used to try and engage the community. And I think it's because if you have a topic that you're particularly interested in, then you can choose that particular topic to learn more. And so as an example, um, our um, residential zoning districts, our neighborhood zoning districts, that was a topic that was really well attended. People wanted to understand what was happening in their neighborhoods. Same thing with trees. There's a lot of passion in our community about Charlotte's tree canopy. And so had a lot of people come in and want to talk and understand what the proposed regulations were around trees. So um, we originally had planned to close the comments on January the 14th and work on a new draft. And we really just felt like because of the technical nature of, the, of an ordinance like of this length, um, that we just wanted to take more time for people to, to digest it, to understand the topics. And so we have extended the first window of comment through March the 18th. And so we're gonna start to tee up another set of virtual conversations and certainly we'll revisit the topics of, like say the neighborhood zoning districts and trees, but there's some other, other things that are starting to develop that I think we need to talk more about. Um, Short-term rentals, um, so your Airbnbs, that type of, um, that type of thing has definitely been um, probably the, the highest source of comments that we've gotten thus far. And so we wanna have some conversations about that. Um, trees, again, we'll revisit. Parking is starting to be one that people are asking a lot of questions about. How are you addressing parking in the UDO and in particularly which uses? So we will start to post those new virtual sessions on our website shortly. Um, next slide. And so I just wanted to wrap up just with a, a glimpse of what the schedule looks like for everything. So Alicia talked about the policy map um, and we've got you know, the second draft that's out there right now. And we're looking for hopefully council adoption the end of February. The strategic mobility plan, that's what um, is led by our friends at Charlotte Department of Transportation. So um, they're out there doing community engagement right now and are looking to have the first draft of that out in late February. And then the UDO, um, you see the first draft came out in October. We had originally planned to have another draft out in March, but instead we've decided, as I mentioned, to take more time to get comments from the community. Those will be due in March. We'll issue a second draft in May, have a public hearing, and then um, a third draft, then hoping to have council adoption the end of July. And with that, I think that's it. And we- Let's about... see if we can't take some questions from the chat. Jeff Freeman, if you wanna unmute yourself, I'll let you ask your question. I see you, Jeff. There you go. There we go. Okay. Um, basically, I'll just read it. It's easier. Is there a formula or requirement the developers will pay a fee to cover some of the additional expenses for schools, utilities, police, the fire department, et cetera? It seems that they are making extraordinary profits and want to know if they are paying their fair share. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, and it is. I'm sure you have a great answer. What, <laughs> well, I'm what sure you're you have a great answer. <laughs> what you're describing um, in its truest form is an impact fee. 
Um, and so uh, there are a lot of states out there in the United States that have impact fees. So when you develop, you pay fees and it goes towards exactly as you're describing. Um, so schools, um, maybe it's parks, et cetera. Um, the state of North Carolina does not uh, allow its municipalities to, um, to impose impact fees on projects. So it's not a tool that we currently have, although it's one that has certainly been brought up a number of times as to whether that should be changed at the state level to address that. I've worked in other states that had those and um, it does help to support those important services that are needed in the community. Um, there are, you know, when projects go through uh, rezoning before city council, like council member Ashmira, um, there are, um, they're often asking for different types of entitlements that they may, um, that they don't currently have. And so in exchange for those, they provide some public benefits um, for, for those particular cases. And so in rezonings, there's some negotiation there that helps to cover some of those impacts to um, areas that you described, but that's, those are really, that's really the only place that it's done in its truest form is really in rezonings. Um, so I can say, say this, that um, in 1995, I was on the zoning board in Cary, North Carolina, and Mayor Glenn Lang tried to control water access. So a developer wanted to build a 300 home development, and he tried to put on, um, developers would have to build a park or build a new elementary school if they're going to have 300 homes, or he wouldn't give them the water permit. And that's when the legislature made it illegal to have impact fees um, here. And that's the difference between red states and blue states. In blue states, you can have home rule. So you can have, Charlotte could have its own minimum wage or Charlotte could have impact fees and Raleigh not. But you, without home rule, all those decisions are made uh, in, in Raleigh. Um, Very good, Matt. Very good. Hey. You know, the Dillon versus home rule state. I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, well, and you know, let me ask you this question. Jersey. I know. Let me ask you this question. <laughs> so, Matt, I just really want to give you an example is... here. Um, so, recently we approved a rezoning for industrial close to Concord Mills Mall. And I remember where developer had made uh, concessions where they provided space to our parks and rec. So there have been some of these negotiations that happens behind the scenes uh, where council member usually leads those discussion, discussions along with staff. Um, however, we are trying to move away from it. We are trying to be more predictable in what development comes. So for an example, like with TOD, uh, that Allison gave an example where Alison touched upon where, let's say if you want higher density, if you want higher height, then if you, you have to contribute towards either affordable housing or provide some sustainability component in your building. So, uh, so there are ways, even though we don't have the tools that cities have um, in across the nation, there are certain, uh, Approach, well, there are certain tools that are we, are we are using to create more affordable housing, to have more sustainable buildings like those LEED certifications, electric charging, electric infrastructure. Uh, and those are called uh, bonuses that we provide. So Allison, if you wanna give a couple of examples where we were successful, where developers contributed towards affordable housing for some of the uh, in exchange for higher bonus height. Yeah, no, that's a great example. Um, and and um, I'm glad, great suggestion, Council Member Ajmira. Um, right now, um, we, we did a, a separate ordinance for our transit oriented development um, uh, ordinance. So that's really anything that's along the blue line. So we did that in advance of the comprehensive plan and the UDO, just because that was an area that was growing so fast and we really wanted to you know, prioritize our investment in building the blue line itself. And so we have a TOD ordinance in place now where there's a bonus menu and you can get additional height if you provide, um, as she was mentioning, affordable housing, 
um, certain sustainability factors. There's um, lead sort of, you know, uh, better energy efficient buildings. And so that that has been very successful. And in fact, um, I think in a year and a half, two years, we have uh, have a, almost $2, $2 million that have been contributed to the Housing Trust Fund for affordable housing. So that's a great model. And that's really just for that half mile around our stations, our, um, our Blue Line stations. So now with the UDO, we will apply those bonus provisions to a lot of our other urban districts. And so probably quadrupling the amount of area that could be used, um, that could use this bonus structure. And so we're looking at potentially expanding some of the other elements of it, but it is a good way in which you can incentivize people and that has you know, a real impact that's positive. You know, you had a specific question. question. Oh, go ahead, Jeff. Um, recently, in the, in the Observer, there's an article about a 211 uh, unit the, in Noda that just got a zone variance. I'm sure you're, you're both familiar with it. And it appears to me that, you know, they, the expression is past performance is an indicator of future activity. It seems that the council, historically, as much as I can read in the paper, that's as much as I know, has given so many variances and it's impacting us regular citizens in a very harsh way as far as uh, increasing traffic, increasing congestion, rush hour traffic is just becoming abysmal. And I, I just really see the council and the other people deal with zoning, they just don't see a, a, a development with, you know, they just give a green light to most developments. And the most recent example is, I don't live in the uh, Alexander Road area. It's where Alexander meets Providence and, and Ray. They have like three very large developments going in that one little two lane street. And it, the traffic is going to be horrible there. And I just am very concerned about the future and the charm uh, ability of, of Charlotte going forward. And one of the things I'll, I'll go ahead, Council Member Ashmir. Oh, well, that's a hard one. So if you want to take that one. <laughs> Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I, I can, can I pose I, a question that's related to Mr. Freeman's statement, actually, because um, what he said, I think, is very important. And it it raises a question in my mind. Um, look, y'all, local government is ridiculously complicated. And every single day I learn more new things than I could even keep track of. So I have a question as a constituent too, that's related to what Mr. Freeman just said. Um, I, I understand that, um, I think it's Cornelius, they just got a new um, board of town commissioners and I believe they have stayed or put a pause on any development, if I'm correct. Feel free to tell me if I'm wrong. And I'm just wondering, you know, because the initial person who asked this question, I was thinking to myself, yes, I mean, on the county side, we we have a goal to have so many acres of green space per resident or, you know, the metrics, and we can't keep up with how quickly new people are coming in and more developments are coming in. And, and so we just, our, our ability to kind of keep up with our um, obligation to provide green space is very difficult when the pace of development is so fast. Um, but uh, sometimes I learn things such as like the city doesn't have discretion, for example, to require an affordable housing. Like you can't do that by law um, when you approve developments. You can do it in exchange for variances is my understanding, but you can't require it just on its own. And I'm wondering, do you have discretion not to approve otherwise, um, you know, approve zoning applications that meet the, you know, meet the standards that they have to meet. Do you have discretion not to allow more development, I guess, is if I may tag on to the back of Mr. Freeman's question, please answer his first, but I would love to know that too. And thank you. So one of the things that, I, that we all struggle with here in a city that we have a lot of people moving to Charlotte. There's, you know, we've talked about the growth a number of times. Um, we are under a severe shortage of housing and housing prices are going up. Affordability is a huge challenge. Um, there was a recent presentation from Dr. Chu, um, who is professor, uh, I can't remember the official name of his title, but 
He works in this, um, the real estate program at UNC Charlotte and is the leading expert on this. And he presented data about how constrained the housing supply is and any housing supply at any price point will help affordability across all levels just because of where we are. And so while we're, so, so it makes us uncomfortable to talk about potentially not allowing development because those are developments for people to live in um, potentially. And so that's a really important part of the affordable housing challenge. And so we've chosen to not go that route, but at the same time, be very proactive and thoughtful about putting together initiatives that cross different departments. So the folks that are you know, in charge of transportation, um, us here in planning, and really start to be more proactive about where we should prioritize growth and where that should be. And so that's why, while sometimes it feels a little overwhelming to have all of these different initiatives going on at the same time, we also think that it's really important to help answer those questions that you all have right now. And so um, you know, we, we understand that transportation and traffic can be a challenge. Um, I think there are course efforts with the silver line and we have the blue line really wanting to you know create an environment where people can get out of their car so we didn't really talk about CDOT but in one of the things that they're proposing as part of their strategic mobility plan is requiring every project that comes through look at a multimodal analysis so how to get so it's really more about moving people than moving cars and that also will help so um, sorry, a long-winded answer to say that we're we're trying to be very proactive in, in helping to address those concerns that you have while not stopping the growth, particularly of things that help support um, just the housing that people need. You so, like to, oh, go ahead. Yeah, so Matt, I'm going to add to that because I know this question is probably directed towards me as a council member. Uh, this is a very complex problem um, where we are trying to increase the housing supply so that will put some downward pressure on housing prices. But at the same time, how do we address traffic and congestion? Uh, and when we talk about building more roads or expanding, there is an induced demand. The more you build, the more traffic, more congestion. I'm from LA and I can attest to that. Um, that's where, as um, Allison said, that's where we need to focus more on how to move people with multimodal transportation options than just moving cars. And we, we, I think council has become very strategic and, and staff has helped us with, with that where we put density. So the example that uh, gentleman had used was along, it was in Noda area along 36, 36, 36 Street Station, I believe less than a block. Uh, Allison, correct me if I'm wrong, but that was a within walking distance to light rail station. So when we look at higher density, we have to look at areas where it's close to light rail stations. Um, and this, all, this is also an environment issue. Uh, and as a chair of environment committee, I'm certainly very passionate about carbon emissions and how we reduce that. So by putting more density, we are also addressing the sprawl, which means if we can provide more density in urban area close to light rail station, Hopefully we won't see the sprawl that we have seen in Charlotte, um, which means that's a better way to preserve and protect rich tree canopy in suburbs. So it is a very, I mean, local government is pretty complex. complex. Yes, we don't have to approve all the rezonings that come our way, but what does that mean for housing prices? We have already a huge shortage of inventory. And um, other thing we also have to consider is um, how do we balance multiple priorities that we have? 
right? We have priorities for housing. We got priorities on infrastructure, economic development, jobs. I mean, we can tell people not to bring jobs here, uh, opportunities for people, because we are also trying to tackle upward mobility crisis that we have. So it is a very multifaceted issue that, um, that certainly we are still trying to address. Uh, one thing that would help a lot is addressing transportation mobility network. And uh, Allison touched on that. We are working um, on uh, investing more in our light trail, silver line, red line, and blue line extension all the way to Ballantyne. And hopefully that will address some of this congestion and traffic, but uh, that's, a, that's, that's decades down the road. Uh, however, we have to plant seeds today to get, make that happen. And so. can I just jump in on that? First of all, I thought that was really helpful. Thank you, Councilwoman. And also I'm gonna be the chair of the, of, um, the Metropolitan Transit Commission for the, this upcoming year. And I just wanna to say to everybody on this call that it's going to take courage and vision and community support to make the investments that we have to make to realize Councilwoman Ashmira's vision of greater transit access and reduction of urban sprawl. That, so we need, I need you to be reaching out to all of your elected officials to let them know that you have their backs for those hard decisions that are, we're gonna have to undertake to raise the funds to invest in real trans, you know, major transit expansion. And I am a hundred percent behind that, but you know, I, when it came up a year ago, um, you know, for example, a lot of people in the North pushed back and it kind of caused it to stall a little bit. And so, you know, we're gonna need everyone in the community to, to make it clear that as a community, we recognize we need to do this and we're ready to make that um, make make the that big investment. So thank you for letting me in interject that too. Yeah, thank you for that plug, Lee. Appreciate it. <laughs> hey, Eli. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna withdraw my question because it was answered on the website. And let me just say, this is the first time I've paid attention to any of the planning efforts in my neighborhood, and they look great. There's this sidewalk expansion. I'm very excited for, for the future, at least of the part that I've looked at. And let me also just say, Dimple, back to your discussion, the, the high density advocates are the silent major, majority in this city, I think. I've seen it in my neighborhood, the, the low density people, they're very vocal and they're always in contact with Matt Newton and inviting him over. But the high density advocates are the majority. We're just too busy and we don't we don't write our city council members enough. So go ahead and do it. Make it high density. That's all. Well, Eli, please write to us. We would love to hear from you because I think more often we get angry emails. <laughs> Uh, and people that are not happy with us. So I appreciate you saying that, that, that means a lot. And uh, uh, you're absolutely right. You know, when we bring some of this development that helps us with uh, park space, because some developments we, uh, we negotiate to include parks. parks. Uh, a lot of this development helps us fill gaps that we have in infrastructure. So thank you for bringing that up. Yes, sidewalks, bike lanes, so some of this development comes with this added amenities that we need because we have a huge backlog, I think 20 year backlog of sidewalks and bike lanes. So thank you for that. So um, John Dabbles has a question that I know will be interesting, but I just put this in context. There are 10 cities in America that have over a million people. Charlotte has about 875, but when you include the SMSA, like the outside areas, Concord and Gastonia, we have over 2.68 million. So the right question is about balance. You know, where do we have more density? Where do we want more parks? And the question I have really, Allison and Alicia, is Charlotte's developing where we don't have one core center city area. We probably have five or six urban areas. I've heard the statistic, I don't know if it's true, but if South Park was a city, it would be the seventh largest city in in, um, in, in North Carolina. So you have um, the university area, you got Ballantyne, you've got um, South Park, you got Center City, and you got Lake Norman area. 
So we really have five different urban or six different urban centers, right? We're, our development's a little bit different than a lot of other cities. Am I right? And how does that affect our planning? Alicia could probably talk to you about this for hours because we spent a lot of time on the comprehensive plan talking about the different ways in which cities grow. Um, and is it large centers? Is it a series of neighborhood nodes? All of that. So there, I mean, we do have existing centers, but that was part of the plan is how we, how we, um, how we modify that model for Charlotte's future. So Lisa, you, I'm sure you can yeah. talk you, you're, more about that. You're right, Matt. And I think um, the way to think about it is uh, we've talked a lot about transportation and, and congestion. And just think if our region only had one center, um, then everyone would try to come to that one place to work, that one place for everything. And the beauty of where we live in this region, there are several different centers and they're not equal. I would say the sizes are, uh, uh, they're definitely larger than probably some smaller towns throughout North Carolina, but they are, um, there is a hierarchy, I would say. I would say Center City might be um, considered our ultimate regional center. It's the kind of the hood, but we also have other pockets like South Park, Valentine, um, University City, um, our airport area is growing. But what it does is it provides that those nodal developments that shorten the trips that people make to live, work, and play in, in our community. And so uh, what the comprehensive plan has done along with working with our regional partners is we share data and we share our planning efforts and priorities to make sure that as we're talking about growth, we're thinking about it regionally and not just Charlotte, here's how we want to grow, but there are growth allocations and projections for our region. And we talk about how do we share that growth? And then how do we make sure that our, our investments in infrastructure, uh, we're thinking about it from a regional perspective as well as balancing our local needs. And so it, I, I think the way that we're thinking about growth is, is smart um, in, in thinking about how we plan for it, especially how we invest in that growth over time, because we're shortening our trips and providing opportunities for different parts of our community um, in, various, in various ways. So that's a good point. That's Can one I of the reasons why I stay here. <laughs> well, it's complex. It's it, you know, it's really is complex. You know, the whole dirt, urban density and then transportation planning. When you start getting into education on top of that, it, it really becomes a whole. You know, it's a great career to get into city and regional planning. John, you want to ask your question? Uh, yeah. First of all, I apologize for, <clears throat> for no video. I've got a glitch with my system. So, but to get to control uh, global warming, and by 2100, we back up to 2050, and there's a nationwide effort to go zero emission or zero carbon emission by 2050. We're all familiar with transportation, but the, the building sector, sector is almost commercial and home, almost as large as transportation. And I was wondering, what is the measurement uh, in the ordinances about greenhouse gas emissions? And as we try to electrify HVAC systems and so forth, is there something in the ordinance that measures greenhouse gas emissions? Because if we don't start now, we'll not get to the 2050 target. So that's a topic near and dear to my heart, John. Um, and uh, when we talk about uh, measuring our emissions goal, we are measuring it for our internal city operations uh, because of our strategic energy action plan goals that we have in place. But when it comes to community-wide goals, we are looking to adopt um, methodology and policy and plan in place over next year. Actually, this year, our plan is to adopt that and use and get private sectors buying to use the same tools where we can share data and how do we reduce our uh, emissions 
uh, because we do have a very aggressive goal. So stay tuned on that. We are working on uh, gathering um, good data from our private sector, uh, from our private sector partners. And if I can uh, just add to you um, on John's question, I just spent all of last Friday interviewing firms for a deep ener energy retrofit uh, from all Mecklenburg County buildings and services so that we can you know, get the right expertise on board to find out how we can reduce our emissions and our footprint and be cleaner and greener. So I just wanted to throw that out there for Mecklenburg County. Very good. Thank you. Michael, you want to ask your question? Got to unmute though. No, I was just curious. It seems like uh, the the areas, just the massive influx of people coming here and the homes being built and so forth, it just seems to me like, you know, our fire departments, our police department, et cetera, are not keeping up. It just doesn't seem like they're keeping up. I mean, I, coming from the Northeast, um, you couldn't drive very far without seeing a police officer, right? Here, sometimes I feel like, you know, I can go, I live in the Ballantyne area. I, I feel like I can go sometimes a month without seeing one. And you, you just wonder too, you know, God forbid you have a fire in your house, right? You know, what's the response time going to be or some other kind of tragedy? It just seems like, you know, if so many houses are being built, you would think that there would be some kind of ratio between number of homes and the amount of, you know, firemen or women that we would need to uh, to service the influx of people. It just doesn't seem like it's keeping up. I'd just like you to maybe comment on that a little bit. I will say um, during the development of the comprehensive plan, police, fire, schools, parks were very, very involved in our process in making sure that the growth projections, like the numbers that say how we're going to grow the next 20 years align with um, their, their plans for providing adequate facility. Again, the challenge is to, um, as fast as we're growing as the development happens, we, we don't have that capability today to require uh, that development to, to, to help us to provide that infrastructure. So it's that it's always that challenge of providing the investments um, as planned as quickly as we grow. But um, as as council uh, member uh, Ashmere mentioned, you know, developments like the the Noda one and some of the others, they're able to negotiate some of those improvements as we um, grow as as quickly. But do know that those folks are really working hard to make sure they understand how we're going to grow and where that growth is happening so they can can plan their facilities as well. Um, it's just providing that that investment to make sure it happens as time, as quickly as we're growing. That's that's been the challenge. Right. I know I know people are not keen on higher taxes, but as you would think that, you know, that would be something that would be a way to generate additional revenue to get ahead, try and keep up, at least keep up with it, if not get ahead of it. So we, we already have, Michael, we already have, uh, council has already approved additional officers, uh, but there's a sh shortage. Um, we haven't been able to uh, recruit and retain many of our officers. And I remember when Chief Jennings our police chief Jennings gave us a report, uh, annual report on 2021. Uh, he did uh, warn us that as we get close to 2023, 2024, we are going to see a lot of uh, folks retiring in the same batch that he was hired in 90s. So a lot of these folks are getting ready. So we even have to uh, increase uh, hiring and and I think uh, police are, right now, they're doing everything they can to try to get more folks to, uh, they're using multiple recruiting strategies, but it is challenging. 
firefighters, we don't have as much recruiting challenge. However, still we are understaffed. So, uh, but if you look at our response time for both fire and for police, we are actually above, well, we are still under this national, uh, uh, um, national, um, there is a benchmark, we are still under that. And I, I can share the report uh, that CMPD shared with us uh, in terms of where we are today, what is the shortage and what is our plan to hire? I think there was two, 300 new police officers that we'll have to hire in next two to three years. So uh -huh. yep, a lot of manpower. Um, yeah, but I, I'm happy to share with you the annual police report that does have information on response time. So if you want to send me an email, my email address is in the chat box and I'm happy to provide you all that data. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Matt, we have one final question from Bishop in the um, chat to me. So um, Bishop, you unmute, you can uh, ask your question. Thank you. Sure, thank you. It's a very good program, by the way. And uh, my key takeaway before I get to my question, I think uh, uh, Councilwoman Lee Altman mentioned it when she said that um, local governance has never been more complicated. And boy, I think that's evident just by the discussion the last hour. For example, um, you know, how do you balance urban sprawl versus affordable housing? Because both have very different sets of economics, um, but good job. My question is, is there a standing committee allowance for the future's studies that are clearly going to be needed and should be part of the overall governance? And if so, how often do you think it would be helpful to have the vision thing uh, presented to the public for dialogue. So anyone? <laughs> Let me make sure. So you're asking? It's a living okay. document. It's a living document. <clears throat> and so it's never going to get right. And it's never going to be totally okay. percent right. And I guess Bishop's asking, the vision is going to continue to evolve. Yes. And how do you yes. how 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 do you guys see it uh, involving other groups like ours right. and the general public in the future evolution? We okay. kind of reached out to you to kind of right. bring you in because I knew you were doing an outreach. Right. Right. And in the future, okay. how do we do more of this? Okay. So so here's what's going to happen. Um, the policy map gets adopted. The comprehensive plan definitely is a living document. Uh, we will produce an annual report every year. That's a good check. How are we doing with the policy? What do we need to pivot on? And um, that will be an, a public facing um, type of tool that we share. There's also an implementation dashboard, which is a little more technical. It has measures and all these metrics and stuff for each one of the objectives. And then it has, here's how we're tracking it. And that way, you can um, track our progress on certain things and also hold us accountable for stuff too. I think um, that is extremely important as we continue to do this, that um, the community holds the city accountable for what's getting done and what's not getting done. And then also another key component to this work and that we know the community loves to get involved in is that area planning process where we work with individuals on um, their particular neighborhood or areas about very specific issues. Because the things that we're talking about now are 30,000 feet, very high level issues. But we do know that some neighborhoods and some areas need a more tailored approach to their responses to things. And so there will be a process that we kick off next summer to work in certain communities to um, address some of those specific needs. And then another thing, um, and, and I'll be quiet, is um, we used to have, before this process, um, a community planning academy. 
it really was the grassroots way of just teaching the average person about all this complicated technical stuff. How can I, as a regular neighborhood person, get involved, educate my neighbors, become a, a civic leader or a next citizen planner in our community? And so that's a curriculum that we used to have and we're relaunching it. And we'll go out to different communities and train and just have dialogue about how we can create just um, everyday citizen planners um, and folks that have participated in that have gone on to be planning commissioners, city councilmen, um, they've run for office and, and really have taken that information and really gotten engaged and used that. So those are a couple of ways that you guys can get involved and, and help, help us to, to keep this vision um, living. Matt, I have no more questions in the chat from anybody. <coughs> Any more questions? Well, we're about say. 25 past seven also, we've almost finished up. Yeah, I think we're done. I think we're done. I, I, I think we may, if you have any closing statements, um, council member Ajira Dimple, if you would like to say something or. Um, yeah, well, next time hope to see you all at Temple Bath Hill. I've always enjoyed my visit there. Uh, I certainly loved uh, when uh, there was a Rabbi Judy Schindler's farewell. So that was the last time I was there, but I always enjoyed our, my, our visit there. So hope to see you all in person uh, someday. And uh, again, thank you so much for having us. Thank you. And Leigh, do you want any, any final comments? Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, this is how we have, you know, there's so much cynicism about politics and government and a lot of it's completely well-deserved. But one reason why I just love being a county commissioner and working in politics at the local level is that it's kind of the real deal. Um, you know, we are here for you, I'm here for you. And this process can be heavily influenced by you. Um, the link that I just put in the chat, you know, we have three major opportunities for you to influence things. Number one, we're in the middle of our budget process as I believe city council is too. And they'll be taking your input if you would like to give it. So you can get involved with you know, county budget. We also have uh, millions, tens of millions of dollars in ARPA funding that we are seeking community input in. And also uh, we're undertaking a new initiative called participatory budgeting, which allows different neighborhoods to lobby for for them to create a project and funding for it on you know in, in a micro way for like your area your neighborhood um and i think that's just all of these are just great ways for you to really have an impact and i mean i too am like generally obsessed with national politics um but this is i just say to you this is a more fruitful in some ways um you know you might really enjoy digging in even deeper than you have tonight because there's so much that you can get involved in and really have an impact so please show up to my meetings early and often i want to see y'all there and hear your voice and thanks so much for caring and spending the time tonight and allison and alicia thank you so much for your time if you have any parting comments I just wanted to say just what I said. We really enjoyed the conversation tonight. It's been um, it's been really enjoyable being with you all today. And so thank you for having us. And um, please participate uh, in the process. Um, learn more about the policy map. Uh, learn more about the UDO because we would really like to hear back from you. Thank you. Bishop, it's a wrap. You want to wrap it? <clears throat> Bishop? Nope. It's all good. I think uh, it's a good way to end it. Very good. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, guys. Enjoyed it. Be safe, everybody. Good luck. Thank you. Have a good night. <laughs>